much for a very productive uh, first part. Uh, I think there may be one or two people coming in, but uh, let's get started and uh, let's finish by 5.30 and make this a really productive session as well. Uh, so during this part, we'll be looking forward. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, taking the EULF and uh, best practices in general and applying those to particular applications. We'll first of all hear about the uh, EULF pilot studies. Then we'll have two case studies from Denmark and the Czech Republic and the bus did arrive. So that's good news. Uh, we'll then be hearing about how do we know we've succeeded in all of this. So we'll share a possible approach with you and then something on our work plan for going forward. And then there's another chance to, to get up and, uh, and, uh, and breathe properly. So uh, I'll first of all start by introducing Graham Voles and he'll talk about the EULF pilots. No, thank you, Ray, and uh, hopefully we've had a bit of a chance to cool down outside. Um, so, as we move forward, I think the question is, how do we uh, test some of the ideas in EULF? And uh, what I'm going to do is give you a quick run-through of uh, what we're doing with the pilots, uh, and then explain a little bit in more detail each of the pilots and... Uh, uh, to give you a feel of, of where we want to go. So I think the important thing is we want to test the ideas of EULF in selected policy areas around cross-border situations uh, and to test all um, parts of the polic policy life cycle. So um, we've done quite a lot of hard thinking in terms of putting together a vision, putting together a uh, a blueprint based on the assessments and so forth but now we need to test it and also make use of pilots as a kind of a vehicle to um, test our thinking and to to validate uh, what we're doing so uh, the role of Inspire uh, and to make use of case studies as a, as an evidence for potential benefits in fact later on we'll be talking about benefits in more detail but it's quite a challenging aspect of Inspire and EULF to really articulate who's getting benefit from um, the overall arrangement. Uh, as part of our uh, EULF work program, uh, we make reference to the uh, Intelligent Transport System Directive. Uh, and this has been identified, the whole area of transport has been identified as a a kind of a key area where we can focus and learn uh, EULF, so taking Inspire, bringing it to the transport sector, uh, and uh, we kind of reshaped our program of work to, to align better with that. Uh, and Ray showed earlier uh, some of the stages which we're going through within the project, so yes, developing a vision, doing the survey, putting together a blueprint, uh, and be using these pilots as a kind of a, a method or a mechanism to validate what we're doing in the blueprint, uh, in this particular case, the transport domain, uh, and also to, to contribute to around clarifying those quite elusive benefits uh, and, and making it clear and articulating those benefits at various levels. So uh, not only is it kind of testing our thinking in the blueprint, it's also trying to contribute to that. So. Uh, hence the two red arrows there. Uh, and what we're doing, as with the rest of the EULF, is we're, we're trying to structure our thinking very much around the, the focus areas. So I've taken as an example here, transport pilot. How do we use transport pilot as a way of validating EULF, the blueprint, and can we validate it within the intelligent transport systems policy domain? So at the various levels, uh, how do things align at that policy and strategy level? Uh, if you open up the ITS directive, it makes reference to Inspire. Uh, uh, and some of the uh, delegated acts that have been developed under the ITS directive make 
deep reference to inspire so uh, I think it's very important that there is this alignment at a, uh, a policy level and that means those investing in, in implementing inspire can then reuse that elsewhere um, within the e-government integration we're looking for location enabled uh, ITS applications so I don't know if you guys know the transport sector um, but there's a lot of visionary things like driverless cars, your Google cars, uh, driving down uh, well-maintained infrastructure, road infrastructure, uh, and to enable more intelligent use of that road infrastructure, you now need much more intelligent data, and this is what we feel we can bring by bringing some Inspire experience uh, to complement what's already there in, in within the transport sector. Uh, around return of investment, uh, and I'll get onto this in a little bit more detail later, is we're trying to really articulate those benefits, uh, make it quite tangible, and understand uh, who benefits and how we mutually benefit by doing these activities. Uh, and then around standardization and interoperability, we've got uh, these two worlds, I'm also almost going to say two universes, that we're trying to bring together, the Inspire world, the e-government world, and in this case, uh, uh, something called the TNITS, uh, uh, technical specifications, and how do you make those work and play together. Uh, and I think as part of the effective governance and partnership side is we're really looking to encourage the collaboration between Inspire uh, and the ITS community. Uh, so what we're doing within, for example, the, the transport pilot uh, use case is where uh, the standard, if you, if you look at TNITS, the TN bit comes from transport network, the Inspire transport network theme, ITS, Intelligent Transport Systems. Uh, it's a standard which is uh, made a lot of use of Inspire uh, technical framework so in terms of Inspire services uh, and data specifications uh, and we are uh, using that specification as a way of sharing what they describe as safety related road attributes so to you and me it's things like when you go past a road sign uh, and there's a speed limit on that sign the road authority who maintains that shares that information using this uh, TNITS specification and likewise with a lot of other safety related information about roads uh, and uh, this has been going on uh, within uh, map providers so ITS map providers so that's organizations like TomTom Tom or Nokia here uh, um, to maintain their data and uh, to be able to share this attribute information you need to be able to locate it quite accurately so, and uh, one of the key challenges is around this reliable form of uh, geo-referencing. Um, and this diagram is trying to draw, draw out the landscape of stakeholders. So who's benefiting and how are they benefiting? Uh, and this has been sort of based on quite a lot of discussion between the various parties. So uh, in the inner triangle, at the top we have what we've called ITS map providers, so these are people creating services around intelligent transport systems data, TomTom, Tom, Nokia here, uh, they want to build those navigation applications, they want to make uh, more sophisticated use of the road infrastructure, uh, and for them to do that they need accurate timely information about the road network, uh, and that's usually provided by the public road authority, so those public bodies responsible for maintaining the road infrastructure uh, and increasingly we're seeing uh, collaboration and connection with the national mapping and uh, cadastral authorities uh, sharing information uh, at a, a across the public sector and we're now trying to bridge this world vertically between oh here's public sector needing to comply with Inspire sharing stuff with private sector who's got no obligation to comply with Inspire uh, and uh, 
to test some of these ideas, we are bringing together three um, related projects. So uh, ELF to provide some of the infrastructure uh, in terms of sharing data. Uh, TNITS, the community who are familiar with the, the transport network and ourselves, uh, European Union Location Framework. Uh, and we want to do this experiment um, to share this critical safety related at, uh, attributes. Uh, we also have a, a sister pilot going on uh, around the marine sector uh, and this is very much ba based on the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So there's a specific Article 19.3 uh, which is about Inspire Services and to make sure that again the same technical framework is followed for Discovery View Download uh, and are implemented within the, um, according to Inspire. Uh, and uh, I think that's um, Part of what the pilot's doing is understanding and artic articulating more clearly what the relationship is between, again, those two worlds, the Inspire world and the Marine world, uh, and mapping, um, for example, uh, observation needed, or observations needed to uh, the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive indicators. Uh, so in, in Inspire speak, that's uh, spatial data sets. Uh, and are already partly covered within the Inspire data models. Uh, this is the program of work which is foreseen to last a duration of uh, 16 months. So to understand what those uh, requirements are coming from the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive and how that relates to Inspire. This mapping exercise to map the uh, uh, MSFD spatial data requirements uh, in, uh, into Inspire and making a mapping of the various objects uh, and that's going to be um, tested within uh, member states. Uh, work package three is around uh, using the Inspire infrastructure for uh, MSFD, uh, understanding what's already in place within the national SDIs. Uh, and uh, making use of the EULF blueprint, um, uh, particularly around those focus areas, which we r repeat quite quite often. Work package four is to take the EMOD net uh, and uh, to uh, align that with Inspire, uh, and finally to uh, uh, clearly understand the cost and benefit case, and uh, uh, to make sure that it, the overall benefits and values delivered out of the pilots are well understood. And work package six is very much around uh, training and capacity building um, and that's foreseen to uh, last over a duration of 16 months in total. So this slide is way too small to see, uh, uh, certainly from the back, but you will be quite familiar with the Inspire implementation roadmap. Uh, and then the blue boxes are essentially showing various parts of the uh, MSDF and how those relate to the ongoing uh, Inspire activity uh, and sort of where the key touch points are between the, the two things. So um, within uh, Marine Pilot uh, there's a project charter. Essentially this is the terms of reference for the marine pilot which is in discussion and uh, now completed. Uh, the uh, concepts and aims has been uh, presented to member states. Uh, so overall I think it's agreed in principle and uh, a call will be coming out very soon, uh, around a, an expression for inter interest for organizations and individual experts to participate in this. So keep an eye out for that call to be coming out. Uh, and that will be uh, presented and discussed in further detail with uh, member state repre representatives. Uh, and the uh, plans are to set up some of the early contracts around this work quite soon, uh, into next month. 
Um, we're also conducting a, a feasibility, what we're calling a pre-pilot uh, around the energy sector. So um, energy was also identified as quite a key uh, policy area which um, uh, EULF could be of benefit to. Um, it happens to have a lot of complex uh, legislation, uh, but it's, it's all about important stuff and it's all about more effective use of uh, our energy resources uh, and uh, by consequence reducing emissions and so forth. Uh, I think a key directive there is the energy performance for buildings, this EPBD directive. And um, uh, what we want to do within the coming months is to conduct this feasibility study to assess uh, if that could be a, a potential third pilot to, to take forward. Uh, so for the en energy performance directive, uh, there's already uh, a use case within the inspired um, data specifications for building. So essentially this is about how efficiently do you uh, create buildings that have good uh, insulation characteristics, um, so reducing uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, and one of the driving aspects behind this is this uh, covenant of mayors around uh, sustainable energy. So uh, across a large number of various cities uh, there's this collaborative e effort to uh, create sustainable energy action plans and probably in the city, city where you come from your mayor is trying to work out how can we reduce uh, CO2 emissions uh, and this covenant of mayors framework is uh, enabling uh, some of that to be done. So I think the initial focus is around um, municipal buildings uh, and making those as efficient as possible uh, and then moving on to tertiary, residential, uh, how you can do public lighting most effectively, making use of urban transpor transportation as effectively as possible. So we see that as a basically uh, uh, a third um, sector where we can test the ideas behind uh, EULF. So those are the objectives as set out in this pre-pilot. Um, uh, framed with the, the Covenant of Mayors uh, baseline emissions inventory uh, and how that relates to Inspire. Uh, uh, we want to use this as a way of pointing out uh, gaps and inconsistencies um, uh, with the overall approach and identify recommendations uh, and ways of improving uh, location related energy information. Uh, and the idea is that would be a sort of a, a third way of testing our, our thinking within the ULF. Uh, so pretty much th that covers off the three pilots which we, we have in mind. I also would like to make a quick plug for Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday at the conference centre, the joint session, we want to connect with this uh, Intelligent Transport Systems uh, uh, Congress which is happening in Helsinki. So fingers crossed the idea is we're going to do a web conference link, uh, do a symbolic reaching out to ITS community. So Wednesday, three o'clock, uh, at the main conference center, you want to be there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Graham. And uh, that ends uh, the lesson from the EULF. <laughs> um, now we have uh, two case studies, and the first uh, case study is uh, from Denmark. And uh, I'll invite uh, Ulla to, uh, to, to come up here. And um, it's really important, I, I should stress, uh, that EULF is not creating best practices. Most of the best practices are, are out there and we want to reuse them and, uh, and have uh, everyone take them on board. So uh, please listen. It's not fun. No, no oxygen. Help me out. <laughs> oh, do I have to hold the mic? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's no, it. No, no, no. no, no, no. Do, do I speak from the back of the mic? No, no. The other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. 
We had two make missing mixing it up. That's okay. I'm not the answer. No, yeah. no, you're not. But uh, we're trying. <laughs> I I can blink my way through this session. <laughs> no problem. I think this is the interesting. <laughs> one. This is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> we rehearsed this. Yeah. We, we did. Yeah. So I think Mike yeah. goes down. This yes. Yeah. This comes with this. Yeah. Ah. Feels right. Feels right. Feels right. <laughs> But thank you anyhow, right? That was no use whatsoever. Mm. Up and down. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, and I announced that we were going to get some more oxygen, uh, but we haven't seen the technician yet. Um, cross our fingers, he will probably come when we're finished. Yeah. Hope. So <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and I'm just standing here being serviced. Yeah. Excuse the technician. Good. So we go. <coughs> Thank you for having me on. I find the work that uh, is being done on a workshop like that and in our organizations afterwards very very useful and the initiative of ILF, ILF or whatever we call it uh, I think make us think in more in a more holistic way and I like that when we open up our tap to tap water when we go for a drive to to visit our aunt or uncle or when we switch on the lights we do not think about where this infrastructure comes from who deals with it who has done it what it's made of I mean every time we switch on uh, the light if you should think about the infrastructure lying underneath we would never ever get to read a book we take this for granted as, as well as we take for granted that we have fresh air and uh, clean water so why is it that when we speak about digital infrastructure, and especially when we speak about Inspire, we go all like this? And I mean, we ask the users to understand this. We ask the users to care about this before they can get the data they're going to use. That is not fair, and it's not feasible. Of course it's not easily solved and we know that Inspire has to solve more problems than just tap water for a user. We know it's about governmental uh, processes, we know it's uh, legal and of course there is a lot of difficulties just in that. But it doesn't have to be all that difficult is my statement here. So make it accessible and how can you do that? A couple of years ago, uh, my agency, in collaboration with another agency and uh, a few private companies, thought exactly the same. How can we make it easy for e-government and other users to integrate map visualization in their solutions? And uh, they came up with something called show the location. It was actually uh, targeted uh, against e-government. It was targeted against uh, these new portals coming up, uh, servicing the citizen. And it was all about providing an easy-to-use APA. And easy to use on your website, easy to integrate if you're a football club or someone who likes the nature and like to hike or whether you are actually a government using your portal to service the citizen. Uh, it's developed in uh, open source and it's developed in a community that still exists and still maintains uh, this IPA with a lot of add-ons. So it's free to use, everything goes back to the trunk. What was quite interesting here was that when we started this community, we weren't quite sure how is private sector and public sector going to work when nobody is being paid. Is the private sector really that keen on making such a solution platform that they will do it on their own time and spend their own money? And the answer is yes, they were, because they could see business on the other side.
they got something hooked into the public sector and they could develop uh, business on that. So that was a success story and it was very uh, shortly after integrated into one of the big uh, e-government portals which is uh, Citizen Decay. A lot of services, doctors, schools, whatever you need to know about and find your way around as a citizen. So that was good. But of course this is not the, the only solution, it's not the only example of location in different solutions. During the last five years and uh, also with the open data in Denmark as you are probably quite aware of, different solutions has occurred. But the knowledge outside the SDI silo, outside our domain, was very limited. Nobody really knew about these solutions and a lot of places they were duplicating or inventing the wheel again as I heard this morning. So we had a lot of double work and we thought how can we get around this and how can we have a platform where we can inspire people who do not know anything about geodata to actually provide solutions. And uh, again in collaboration with the private sector and the association for the geodata domain, Geoform Decay, um, we developed this portal which is called Use the Location. And Use the Location is a collection of showcases. And it is a platform where you can go and have just a quick overview or read more about how to access it, access it machine to machine or as a user. And this is here where I will tempt Murphy. I haven't seen him but I will try to do it as well. That was why I brought my glasses. I will try to access the internet. The big three. Yeah, you may have to jump in. Bit slow, but then again it's Avalon. Oh, well, it's Sony. Yeah, well. Okay. Don't ask again. It's like the same with the cookies. What is more annoying that I always have to say, yes, it's okay with the cookies. And no, I don't want translation. And do I want that? Yeah, I got it. So it's okay to press okay. I got it. Okay. Eventually, we are on. Oh, come on. So here we go. For instance, this here is is it running? Yeah, it's an app who has actually saved life twice. It was launched uh, last year. It has been made. Uh, my agency has provided knowledge. Uh, one of the big funds in Denmark has provided money and private developers has developed. This is an app that uses lo the location. I got it on my phone and you can have it. It works all over Denmark. It's very simple. Something happens, you break your leg or you see somebody who has fallen and you actually press one button. And with that button you activate your GPS who automati automatically sends your location to the central police or whatever and then you're asked to answer what's what's going on and so on. So you don't have to know where you are. You don't have to be able to pronounce the street name. And in many places there are no address. You could be in the middle of nowhere or you can be like here. If something happens here, what is the address? It's quite difficult for, the, for, for an ambulance to, to find it. So that's very good and it has proven uh, useful quite simple and funded for money that wasn't my agency's. Okay, one more. Let's see if I can find it. There we are. Yeah, we can go here. <coughs> to look at 
pollution in Europe. So it's not only Danish solutions that are lying here. I invite you to go, yeah, I know it's, it's, uh, most of it is, <laughs> is in Danish, but there are some, uh, some links to, um, to websites that are translated. But overall, this platform, this collection of showcases has brought on a huge interest also from people at university, also from people outside the SDI um, ghetto. So back to the... Still here. Hmm, that one, or that one, or that one, or that one. I blame it on the lack of oxygen. It's it's absolutely the lack of oxygen. It was the other one. You're a very patient audience. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing is going on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Minecraft is is quite a funny um, it's quite a funny use case because I mean, like six months ago, we would never have dreamt about anything like that coming from our agency. We are so serious and we are so governmental. But these open data. Uh, we're just there and we had uh, an update on elevation uh, model and that was a huge amount of data and we had some uh, young people actually playing Minecraft and they say why don't we just feed the whole Denmark into Minecraft one to one and our general director was a bit hmm could that be but then he said yeah let's go for it let's give it a try and so they did they shoved all of Denmark into Minecraft and we were after our servers actually went dead because there were so many trying to play this game. Um, that's only technique, so we solved that. What was, what was interesting if from my point of view was the dilemma that this public sector agency um, had when they found out that somebody was demolishing at the actual castle where the queen lived, painting some things that are naughty naughty all over the main uh, city place and things like that but that's part of it it, it was an interesting discussion we had because this is open data this is what happens when you free them on the internet but we have never ever had so many from outside the SDI uh, domain interested in actual location based data and the education sector is using this now. Many schools has this on the program. So something that accidentally happened because two young guys got a good idea is now proven very valid. And this is a happy user. Just after we freed our data, we put all our data into two big hard disks and we gave it to him. Here's Mr. Open Street Map in Denmark and he is very happy. Two days after we have one of the best open street maps in Denmark based on governmental quality data. So I'm almost through. I will just share some reflections uh, with you. Open data, is that an investment? Yes, mm, we say so, the Ministry of Finance says so. But how about growth and efficiency? In the public sector we need to be efficient, we need to reuse, we need to do uh, standards, we need to um, use uniform models and uh, exactly reuse uh, solutions. The private sector has to grow. So is that actually the opposite? Are we killing growth? in the private sector by being more efficient. Not necessarily, but we might have to think about that. These opposites about formats, standards, about APIs, developers. And finally, something that one might spur the coming uh, work we have to do. Are we using the right tools? I think EOLF is uh, hel helping us uh, in maybe reflecting on that. But are we using the right tools? Are we, are we solving the right uh, problems? Is it always a technical fix? Is that the answer to everything? Have we asked the user? That was all for me. Thank you for bearing.
Thank you, Ulla. That's great. So, some really uh, interesting uh, examples there of uh, solving real problems and uh, some really creative applications uh, and some very interesting messages as, as well. But the excitement doesn't stop there. Um, I'll now uh, invite Eva. Um, are you ready, Eva? Yes. Great. <laughs> and there'll be a, a little technical interlude while we load the presentation slides. So Eva's case study, uh, she'll present today, and uh, if you uh, want some further information, it's documented as one of the EULF case studies. So uh, please feel free to, uh, uh, to take uh, an example. Right, this is your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I put it at the very top of the USB, so you should find it easily. It's the latest. This one? Yes, it's, yeah, that's it. So, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, is it? So, thank you for patience. Uh, I will introduce uh, the study, uh, which or it's a long-term process which we have done uh, in the Czech Republic, and uh, I'm always. Uh, uh, following uh, the easiness or such a quiet approach of those coming from uh, the northern or western part of Europe. Because uh, in my part of Europe, we are f still catching up, I think, the end of the World War II, or really there were so many things from the normal life which were interrupted that we still to solve several issues or different issues which are not so needed or so urgent in some other parts of Europe. So our case study, uh, that's why, uh, was more focused uh, on improving the functionality of uh, public administration and on uh, providing better services in the basic level, not the uh, additional one or the happiness above. We just were happy or trying to produce uh, some better services and therefore uh, there was a longer term process, it started already in the late 90s and uh, the location information step by step became a part of uh, the concept of based registers uh, of the Czech uh, public administration. And the idea was that the documents only have to circulate not the citizens because before if you change your address or name or whatever you had to uh, announce as your duty all this information to dozens of various organizations public and private in fact as well and that's why the main idea was to cut this enormous burden and uh, 
there, uh, this uh, concept of the e-government, the person is called Egon, was created and uh, the brain of this guy are the four uh, registers and uh, the heart was the act on e-government and uh, the hands are called the checkpoint but these are distributed locations of public administration which are either on municipalities or post offices so it's uh, the everyday life uh, point where anybody can meet the uh, agendas of administration and naturally this uh, registers are to support these types of activities and um, the four registers one of them is on uh, the inhabitants the second one is on duties it means it describes all the agendas and who is uh, which law and who is uh, responsible and uh, what type of process it's uh, considered and then there is the register of legal persons and uh, that's where we are most interested is the is the register of uh, Identific territorial identification addresses on real estates. So it combines a number of uh, spatial data uh, in it. And uh, they interact, but in the way that they have uh, that uh, all the uh, elements or data is connected by unique identifiers which are unique for each of the registers so it's not that you share information of some concrete person or it's uh, in a way that uh, the uh, persons uh, individuals are protected so from technical point it's uh, challenging and uh, the content of the register of uh, territorial identification uh, c covers uh, not only the addresses but also buildings, streets, uh, the uh, geographic names with their grammar, uh, um, administrative units which start on the level of parcel and go up till the level of the state. And the idea was that uh, uh, through the updating of the content all the other content will be updated so when a border of a parcel uh, comes into change this change when it's uh, edging with some administrative district or upper to the region it goes through yeah, all the system naturally following the legal rules but as soon as possible it's uh, the legal change that's the constitutional draw and then it's uh, it goes directly through the whole system so the updating becomes extremely fast and from the moment when in the office you get it or put it the data into the system within two hours it's published on the uh, on uh, our uh, web page uh, so and it's as open data for uh, any use for reuse as really accessible output and uh, naturally there are interlinkages between the different uh, levels or different uh, uh, spatial objects which are concerned but uh, it's uh, yeah and these are in uh, thousands or millions uh, regarding the type of object so the highest number is of parcels which is more than 20 million and uh, we have uh, a unique number of villages or municipalities they are more than 6,000 and it makes our administration rather challenging on one hand it's that uh, there is the democratic uh, competence of the municipalities but administratively it's not easy and with this register in fact it was the first um, occasion uh, when uh, the way of describing addresses was defined by law and uh, since that we have the uh, uh, unique source of uh, addresses and uh, you see the numbers are different and it means or the colors are different 
It means that uh, there are different uh, sorts of authorities involved in uh, this uh, address uh, definition and uh, constitution. So uh, for the streets, these are municipal assemblies. Uh, for the buildings, these are building authorities. Address points is shared between the building authority and uh, the municipality uh, and so on and so on. And uh, when these small pieces come together, it's the address which is then uh, constituted in uh, the RIAN and used then completely across the whole uh, public administration. So no more discrepancies between addresses which were maintained by municipalities or by uh, insurance offices. It's just nowadays a unique source. And uh, there are nowadays uh, uh, different uh, uh, value-added applications uh, created by public, uh, by um, uh, private sector. And uh, here you see they are uh, about 8,000 uh, organizations uh, involved and uh, they are coping in a way which was uh, defined by law but uh, they always uh, put the data only in the piece of their competence, so spatial or legal as regards the agenda. So it helps that uh, the content becomes uh, uh, valid, becomes uh, of higher value, and there is always the competence in the relevant place, and it helps to avoid multiplications of maintenance of the same type of data. So it's a good improvement, but uh, as we are at the INSPIRE conference, uh, due to this uh, register which uh, was built in the period uh, 2010 to, till uh, 2012. There was then one year still of uh, for uh, different testings and changes but uh, in the operation run it was already from the middle of 2012. We had to uh, implement uh, INSPIRE for the data which is uh, in the thematic uh, uh, context of it. And it meant uh, uh, not only the parcels, addresses, administrative units, but uh, also several other types of data which are some way uh, interconnected as the streets because they are part of the uh, road network. So it became extremely challenging. And we had to uh, look at this system which was complex as such already, also from the complexity of INSMIRE. And it was very, very challenging, but uh, on the other hand, it helped us to uh, start thinking about the systems in an interconnected way, and uh, we succeeded to use the other products uh, which are uh, uh, maintained and uh, provided uh, by the uh, Czech uh, uh, mapping uh, and cadastral authority in an interconnected way. So systems or uh, web services or uh, support uh, tools which used to be individual for individual systems became a part which started to cope much more and this uh, changed attitude was naturally useful also to the change uh, in attitude to other partners uh, from other organizations. So now uh, with the experience with, from this uh, uh, INSPIRE implementation which resulted in that we, that we have already uh, um, the most of the themes uh, uh, which are in the uh, Annex 1 uh, implemented and uh, many others uh, uh, in the progress stage. It helped us to be uh, something as a supporter to the other organizations who are uh, starting with their implementation in the country or in the themes where they uh, where there are more providers uh, uh, to the same theme. So uh, we succeeded to change this complexity into something useful.
And naturally, the system uh, is uh, provided for numbers of situations and it used for numbers of situation, uh, situations. And already inside, it considers uh, different application areas, as for instance, uh, for one building. Uh, when uh, uh, you register your building, you are supposed to provide some technical information and some uh, economic information, which uh, uh, is about the type of building and number of rooms and materials and so on. And this is what the statistics uh, maintains and uses. So it became also interconnected that this exercise is done just one and the statistics can use it then uh, further for their purposes and maintain it further. So it became one source also for this particular uh, agenda, but it's becoming in a uh, number of other uh, areas as well. So the house is not just the building or not just the location. It's something that's uh, surrounded by many, many uh, everyday uh, situations. And actually, to make uh, the content useful, we need to do a number of uh, checks and testings and uh, maintain the input from uh, uh, different types of users. So there is a procedure described because uh, the, when the content is given by the law, it's strictly given which parts uh, uh, who, uh, who uh, edit, uh, who can edit which elements and in which procedure. So also when uh, a claim is uh, registered, we need to go through the procedure to the relevant authority, but the mechanism was created and nowadays uh, um, we also open the uh, this sort of updating or calling uh, that they are mistakes uh, to uh, partners as uh, those maintaining the open uh, uh, street map uh, to get their involvement and then uh, they uh, can use naturally our data of higher quality. So it's just one of uh, different uh, examples. And uh, the very last uh, change or uh, enlargement was uh, the addition of uh, uh, so-called election districts and uh, this uh, was uh, used already now uh, for the, the election uh, for the European Parliament and uh, naturally at the beginning uh, the mayors uh, uh, were responsible at the municipalities had some additional work and uh, they were uh, additional services by private sector as well to maintain all uh, the uh, division into uh, the particular districts but it became uh, very efficient and instead of uh, paper lists in the previous case in some of the small villages nowadays it's a sophisticated system which uh, helps to uh, avoid duplications or gaps uh, in the list and it's uh, switchable regarding the type of uh, uh, the election so it will be used uh, further as well. So when we come back to the original uh, goal uh, to uh, decrease uh, the burden, the red type, to cut the red types, I think that uh, uh, there was a big improvement uh, naturally. It's something was happening in the back office. So people just feel that maybe the officers are more friendly, but they do not know that there are so much activities behind. But it's uh, uh, the important thing is that the services became better. And uh, in April, with uh, 27 million transactions, the uh, the RIAN became uh, the most used uh, uh, register from all these uh, uh, four registers. So 
is more used than the three others uh, uh, together. And uh, so we believe it's really the location has become, that's what's uh, a very incorporated, integrated part of uh, the behavior of uh, the government and uh, of the e-government. And uh, when I was communicating with Glenn about uh, the uh, case uh, study, uh, we were uh, mentioning this uh, brain, uh, being brain of the e-government. And uh, I was thinking that, in fact, uh, that's more about these uh, uh, neutrons and the passes uh, which are in the brain. And that uh, in uh, the brain, when uh, that you, you get it uh, trained and you get uh, more uh, impulses, it becomes more resistant and more capable and more productive. And I was thinking, yeah, it's very nice when we provide this support to the, to the e-government it would be useful and we could be happy and more relaxed as in Denmark <laughs> and elsewhere. So thank you for your attention. Hurrah! There we go. Thank you, uh, Eva. Uh, big things happening uh, in the Czech Republic there. And, uh, and these are the, the sorts of things that we want to see uh, happening uh, everywhere. Um, you know, there, are, there are so many uh, good practices being developed. There's so many opportunities for the use of location in, in e-government. Um, so uh, let's see more of this. And we want the role of the EULF to be a promoter uh, of, uh, of these good things. And also, in some respects, to act as a, as a marriage broker. Uh, you know, if there are things uh, that uh, should be shared, then, uh, then we'll act as a broker in, uh, in, in helping, uh, helping share uh, these things. So, how can we achieve the uh, uh, benefits from uh, the activities of the EULF? So that's what we're going to talk about next. And specifically, that's what I'm going to talk about. So. What is the uh, EULF uh, benefits challenge? Uh, we've established through the uh, uh, through the assessment and through uh, um, our interactions with stakeholders that uh, coherent and committed action is needed to exploit the uh, potential of uh, location information. And the important thing is to solve real-world problems. Um, so to concentrate on. Uh, on uh, on particular applications and priority needs. So, how do you know what areas to address, what actions to take, and how do you how do you measure that? So that's the benefits challenge that we we have. We learnt from the survey that there's a number of barriers, important barriers, in uh, realising the potential of location information in in e-government, and and you now these are some of the some of the, the problems uh, that we've got to tackle, some of the, the barriers that we should aim to remove. We got uh, confirmation on, uh, on various issues that need to be focused on and we built that into our work on the, on the focus areas. We also uh, had identified various benefits that might come from from getting things right so that that gives us uh, some ammunition to say yeah there are some opportunities here so uh, uh, so how do we grasp those uh, those opportunities we pull this together and we've identified uh, you know, from our contacts, from our analysis um, you know, that, that there are benefits to government, benefits to citizens and businesses, benefits to research and, uh, and, uh, and academia and you know, benefits in important areas like uh, you know, saving time and money 
like uh, developing policy more, ef helping develop policy more effectively and achieve policy outcomes, give citizens and businesses a better service from government and save their time, support growth and, em and employment and uh, enable more innovation, more in innovative research and better evidence to support policy. So yes, we believe that those are the benefits, but how do you achieve that? Uh, in simple terms, uh, the slide here gives some indications on, on how uh, we can achieve better location enablement. But uh, we want to have a, a more robust process to know that we're heading in the right direction and to help us target the right things. So I'll describe to you some, uh, some initial ideas on, on that process and uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the distinctions between actions, impacts and outcomes because these are important in that approach. You can't just say Inspire delivers these benefits, EULF delivers these benefits. It, it doesn't. Inspire, EULF, they're intermediaries in a very complex process of delivering benefits. So look at this. Uh, if you train, if you're a runner, if you train at, at altitude, that's an action that you might take. What does the, what impact does that, does that have? It enables you to run faster. But what use is running faster? Well, there's an outcome. If you uh, enter uh, your national championships and you win a gold medal after uh, taking this action, when last year you finished in 10th place. So that gives an indication of the the, the process that uh, we want to investigate. So we might produce uh, some uh, some guidelines through the EULF or re reuse some guidelines that, that others have uh, produced. That might help deliver applications faster, but it's only when applications are built that deliver benefits that you're actually being able to trace those benefits back to the EULF. So this is the basis of the approach we're considering. Uh, we've described today the vision, the assessment, uh, our focus areas and uh, some of the actions that we are uh, looking to take and those need to be uh, mapped out in order to understand the impacts and the outcomes that they might achieve and we'd like to use case studies such as the pilots, such as an analysis of particular processes or services to give us some indicators on uh, whether we're heading in the right direction and to tell us uh, what we should be targeting. So the pilots, in simple terms, we'd measure uh, pre-intervention and post-intervention and look at the difference and see where the benefits might arise. So uh, we've started to put together some analysis. I'm not asking you to read this, you can't anyway, but it'll be in the papers to come uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the uh, uh, from the session on the on the website. So, for example, for the focus area of e-government integration, our actions and our outputs are around uh, analysing and uh, identifying best practices, uh, developing uh, guidelines on how you might integrate services uh, better, and sharing those through uh, through the ISA program. So that might ha these might have intermediate impacts on making it easier to build applications and saving money and having better quality applications as a result. So there is a value chain there that uh, tells a story and not only is this uh, analysis uh, we think uh, valuable but the stories that come out of it uh, from those case studies and as many stories as possible uh, can help in communicate the, uh, the messages. So uh, as well as uh, tracing the, the benefits, uh, we're looking to identify a series of indicators in each of the policy areas that relate to those impacts so we can measure whether the EULF is heading in the right, right direction. Not too few, not too many, make it manageable. And similarly for outcomes, we're looking to identify a number of indicators as well. Um, and these indicators will tell us, we believe, whether we're heading in the right direction and we'll tie the benefits back in some way to the actions of the, uh, of the EULF. So in simple terms, that's the approach that we're uh, considering. 
and uh, as I said, uh, as well as uh, uh, this structured approach, it is important to tell stories from the case studies. It's not easy. Measuring benefits of uh, infrastructures and frameworks is, is not easy. But this may present an approach that, uh, that might work. We'd like your thoughts in the, in the feedback session. Okay, so that's uh, me, and to finish off, uh, Paul, uh, who will uh, look to the future. The can you hear me all right? Okay. So uh, we have defined a number of uh, phases, three phases of the EULF um, projects. Uh, the first phase is the inception phase, which is ending uh, basically now. And the second phase is then the execution phase, where we will be uh, looking into the application of uh, the documents that we have been producing uh, so far. So it's a, a validation uh, phase. And then the third phase would be uh, if if everything is successful, to have uh, the operation and what exactly that will uh, contain will be described in the roadmap that is part of the documents that the EULF will uh, be producing. Um, so the uh, the this slide is showing the uh, EULF uh, project work plan. Um, Important at all stages is the close interaction with the uh, ISA working group on spatial information and services. That will be um, our source for inspiration, so to speak. Uh, we'll be interacting constantly with them. Uh, and you'll see that also throughout next year we'll be having meetings, both virtual and face-to-face -face meetings with that group. Um, the strategic vision uh, of which we have just published uh, the revised version uh, will be updated next year based on the findings that uh, that will come in uh, in particular uh, from from uh, the, the the project but also the public uh, consultations um, uh, have an important role there uh, the survey we have uh, had uh, important to uh, notice uh, is the uh, uh, the consultation um, towards uh, in, in the second half of this year and then of course we have the uh, the pilot activities um, in in the case of energy it is not uh, not really a pilot yet it is a, a pre-pilot as was explained so uh, we'll see how uh, how the community reacts on uh, on that we defined uh, a number of risks um, in relation to the project uh, and uh, what we also uh, did is to see uh, how, what the impact of these risks could be and how we could mitigate uh, the risks. Um, the, um, I think the, the, um, the, the number one risk is, uh, if, 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 if is, the, is that the value of the EULF as a, as a project is inconclusive at the uh, at the end of the project that would be uh, you know that would be a failure of of the activity um, and uh, and that would also mean that we would fail to bring the EULF to an operational phase uh, and uh, that is why it is so important to have continuous interaction with the stake the key stakeholders uh, including the working group on spatial information and services uh, but also, of course, with the Inspire uh, st uh, stakeholders. Uh, I think it is also important, and that we have seen also through uh, the, uh, the responses to the survey, is that we should move now really to a demand-driven approach. Uh, perhaps you have used, you, you have heard the word user uh, various times today. That, that is exactly what, uh, what, what is needed uh, to shift to a demand-driven approach. It is also important, and that's, that was made clear already from the first face-to-face uh, -face meeting that we, have with the, uh, that we had with the ISA Working Group on Spatial Information and Services, that we need to be practical. You know, it is nice to talk about visions, it, it's nice to talk about grant plans, 
but at the end of the day if you really want to help a public authority with uh, then you need to come up with concrete things concrete guidance that they can use in their um, in, in their day-to-day -day work and that is uh, that is I think something that we need uh, to remind ourselves constantly of um, well, a little bit related to that is the lack of uh, the, the risk of uh, lack of buy-in uh, by member states. Um, the, the impact could be insufficient inputs and take up, uh, and that would uh, eventually uh, affect the, the quality of the EULF. Um, the mitigating actions uh, includes uh, the use of existing knowledge and contacts. Uh, again, the demand-driven approach and uh, effective uh, engagement and uh, validation. Um, so uh, I won't go through them all in detail. This is to give uh, an idea about where we're coming from, uh, where we talk when we talk about uh, risks. So in, in this at this point uh, in time, uh, we have an important milestone. It's the midterm. Um, is, is the mid the midpoint of the EULF project? Um, for for us, it has been uh, for for us. Then I uh, talk about the the the, uh, the ISA working group and uh, and also for the commission. It has been a uh, very useful exercise. I think we have collected a lot of material, uh, but now uh, is really the point where we need uh, feedback from you, from from the community. Uh, to see uh, what uh, what we could improve in order to make the outputs even more um, useful for from from your point of view, um, and uh, and based on that uh, we will be developing the uh, the, uh, the the blueprints uh, and the recommendations and the guidelines in the second phase of the project in order to match the. Uh, the the requirements and the recommendations that uh, that come from the stakeholders. Uh, synergies with other projects and initiatives is important, also at national level. As Ray pointed out before, uh, this is not something that we do in isolation. But what the EU left can do is to be the sounding board that uh, that that gives. Um, Public administrations, not only at national levels, but also at uh, subnational level, as, as uh, was indicated in the discussions before, uh, the possibility to learn from each other and to uh, and to make sure that you have uh, a place to point to when you are discussing with your peers uh, on how to deal with uh, interoperability of geospatial information and services. Then you can say. Look, guys, there's an initiative called the EULF. They are collecting useful material. Uh, let's take a look at what they have done in this context in order to uh, try and, and converge to an, uh, a common approach uh, towards the use and reuse of spatial information and services. So, Ray, now the floor is back to you. Thank you, Paul. That's great. Okay, so uh, the final workshop. The final workshop is to uh, you know, to help us look at uh, the um, uh, those points that we brought out. How can we make the most of this for the future? And uh, what we'll do in this session is to again to break it down into three parts and. Paul, I'd like you to take Paul's corner, and part of your role is to stop anyone else leaving. <laughs> oh, right, and uh, Danny, uh, I'd like you to uh, take Danny's corner, uh, if you can. <laughs> and Graham, uh, Graham in the middle. And uh, if you want to join Paul's group, uh, Paul's group is to answer questions one and two. Danny's group is to answer questions three and four. So policy, practical implementation. And the middle group 
is uh, helping us on benefits and sustainability. All three are important and you can only be in one group so choose wisely and this time only 20 minutes for discussion but I would like 10 minutes feedback because that was really useful last time. Okay? In total 30 minutes. Strictly. Strictly. And there's a reward at the end. Fresh, firstly fresh air and secondly uh, we'll listen to you and build into the EULF what you say. Fives and sixes. Yep. Yeah. So I will join them. <laughs> My group will do it in 15 minutes. Good. <laughs> There's only 10 minutes left. Yeah. Ah, 10 minutes left. Yeah, yeah. Five minutes. Okay. So we'll skip one question. How will we know what we're delivering? Uh, how will we know what we're delivering? What should we do in the war program? Hello, Graham. Just want to say hi. Nice to see you. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. yeah. I didn't know you were going to be here. Okay. Yeah, very good to see you. Yeah, you Are you very welcome to join in? So we're doing questions. Are you five, doing five and six? six. Uh, yeah. I, my brain capacity yeah. is very low yeah. at the moment. I mean, <laughs> <and> I'm not <laughs> fully <laughs> sure this is stable. I'm not sure I can understand the question. The key the thing is, <laughs> if you understood that benefits <laughs> approach, <laughs> is it... Uh, <laughs> If you were asleep at that point, or no, you didn't, didn't, under or you didn't understand. Yeah, it was raining, <laughs> my program, and well, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> So the two yeah. two questions in yeah. simplified terms of delivering value. Yeah. 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 How will we know we're delivering yeah. value from the EU? Yeah. Yeah. Running over and in question six, six is uh, uh, also I need to focus more on finding a good example of the case. Any preference in terms of order? Is no. that something we're also meant to yeah. 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 Because we, we had some own ideas. Can I reflect back a little bit on benefits process? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the punch and pass the challenge of the airlines. It's unfortunately mistaken in the United States. Quantifying if you can measure you from Minister Nemo, which is quite a challenge. For example, work on this benefits. Okay. Part of that is delivering value uh, and is delivering value. Is that something where you would see uh, contributions? Yeah. And then yeah. the second thing is how do you make so uh, things sustained in the long term? Okay. Uh, transportation pilot is not a bad example. <laughs> 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 no, no, it's not. Uh, I mean, in that sense, so more pilots. Right, I can't remember. Yeah. 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 Ye
sure was a statement that you just So we would we kind of feed back and forth, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't get them back in. <laughs> That's the way we incorporate. Just now we'll get them in the side. What you say is that we need maybe something uh, more or something So any else? other thoughts about EU yeah, and yeah. yeah. I hear it's also a matter of language, not national language, but language between yeah. ICT yeah. Yeah. and... Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Let's go and interrupt the sun tanning outside. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. <coughs> Thank you very much. Could we go straight away rather than collect yeah. our things? Otherwise, uh, <laughs> it would slow us all down. Thank you. 